Okay. So yeah, welcome everybody to our first real talk um, that is not happening in the Grüne Salon at the Volksbühne, um, but online, thanks to Corona. And thanks to Corona, a lot more people can watch this event and participate through questions um, than would otherwise have been the case. So the topic tonight is Syria's state torture on trial, a route to justice and the role of the survivors. Um, two days into the court hearings at the higher regional court in Koblenz, uh, where we are witnessing the first world wo um, worldwide trial on state torture on a national level, on the legal basis of the principle of universal jurisdiction against two individuals who are accused of murder, tor torture, and related crimes um, committed at a de detention center of one of Syria's intelligence services in Damascus. My name is Marion Detjen. I work for Bard College Berlin, where the Real Talk series was incepted almost two years ago as an initiative of some of our Syrian students. The aim of the Real Talk series um, hosted by the Volksbühne is to make visible the political discourse of the young, resistant, democratic diasporas, especially from the Middle East in Berlin, and to give this political discourse a, a stage. And this time, Bard College Berlin and the Volksbühne cooperate with the Syria campaign, with Families for Free Freedom and the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. And I want to thank, in the name of Bard College Berlin, all cooperation partners for the very smooth organization of this important event in such a short time. And most importantly, I want to thank Amina Savan, who had the idea and conceived and planned the event and who invited our guests and took care of everything. Amina is a student at Bard College Berlin and she works for the Syria campaign and is involved in many other activities related to the violations to, of human rights and the question of justice for Syria. Uh, we are very honored to have Anwar Albuni, the lawyer who recognized one of the suspects as his former torturer in the refugee shelter in Berlin, and um, Wafa Mustafa, who just graduated at Bard College Berlin, and Andreas Schüller from the ECCHR, and Ben Teschella, who kindly agreed to moderate the event. Um, ben Teschella will in introduce the panelists properly in a second. She's head of the Middle East and North Africa division of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, before I hand over to you, Bente, I would just like to mention one fact, one banal fact, that without the migration movement to Germany since 2014, this trial would not have happened. And it needs the relentless efforts of political af uh, activists in the diaspora and of activists in the host countries supporting their cause that universal jurisdiction can have a chance in our world at all. Yeah, we have many registrations and we hope for a lively discussion online. Your questions will be collected and forw forwarded to the moderator. And um, now, Bente, you have the screen. Hello, thank you very much. And I'm very sorry about the technical problems. My name is Bente Scheller. I'm from Heinrich Böll Foundation and I've been accompanying the work on these cases for all the time. So I'm very honored that today you invited me to be the moderator. And I'm very proud that the occasion is that these trials actually started taking place. It is, as you know, a world premiere. Syrian regime members in front of a court. I'm very happy for all the efforts, the relentless efforts of lawyers that made this possible. And therefore, I'm particularly grateful to see here an old friend of mine again, Anwar Albuni. I know you from Damascus and I know all the work that you put into this. I know you really worked on human rights long before 2011. I met you when you were working in Syria as a human rights lawyer. And you are not only a lawyer, you are also a survivor of Syrian torture and prisons. And you are today the center, the director of the Center, center for Legal uh, Studies. So please, could you give us a first um, opening saying when you started working on these cases under the principle of universal jurisdiction, did you actually think that you would see this day, that you would see Syrian perpetrators in front of a German court? Please remember to switch on your microphone, Anwar. Sorry, Anwar, your mic is off. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. And, uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Amina, for. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I, I met uh, Anwar uh, Raslan in 2014, uh, end of 2014, uh, uh, come uh, with my family. Uh, so, uh, that times I didn't recognize, or I don't know uh, if uh, there is possibility to do something against like these people. Besides, I just arrived to Berlin, uh, confused about situation with my family. But after when we, uh, I met first uh, Andrea from ECCHR after I arrived, and I, I, I contacted. Anyway, so for that I contact them after I arrive and visit him and visit uh, so uh, meet Andreas in fact first time and from that times we continue to cooperate and uh, at 2016 uh, we, we, my, my opinion that we must to start with uh, uh, still in Syria because my opinion like this guy it's here now. We can't catch him anyway. He haven't any uh, protection. So we must to follow first the people who have protection, who have, and to prove uh, maybe we can save people life in Syria still suffering in the detention. For that, we start on this topic uh, before. But at 2018, uh, after the uh, police about uh, Anwar R and uh, his uh, uh, action in Syria before he uh, left Syria, uh, the prosecutor uh, through uh, ECCHR also uh, uh, contact me and uh, ask my testimony about Anwar R. They know. Uh, uh, I, I know him, and uh, he arrested me, in fact, in 2006, <laughs> personally. So uh, we start from that time, 2000, mid of 2018, cooperate with the prosecution office uh, uh, to have the uh, victims. And most of the victims, in fact, I defended them in Syria when they were arrested in this branch and I defended uh, them so I know them personally just I contact them and ask them to join with this uh, uh, case against Anwar R and everybody was so uh, excited to join and uh, prosecute them prosecute him uh, until it uh, start to arrest him uh, while we ECCH, uh, ECCHR also with another cases in Germany and in Sweden, in Norway, in uh, Austria. We submitted four cases here in Germany and one in Austria, one in Sweden, one in Norway uh, against more than 60 uh, uh, high-ranking uh, officer uh, crimes against humanity and torture and kill and torture uh, for the detainees. Wow, so this is quite an, a success. I mean, Germany actually is the first, but I was also not aware that you submitted so many cases and even more spectacular now that we can follow the opening of the first. Thank you, Anwar. Wafa, uh, your followers know something about you already. You are an activist, a Syrian journalist as well, and you're part of the initiative, the movement Families for Freedom, that is asking to release the detainees in Syria and also to have information on their whereabouts. So Wafa, your followers on Twitter know particularly that your father has been arrested for more than 2,500 days now. You posted a lot of messages to remind his fate and thereby also remember the fate of all the others. What does it mean for you that now this trial is happening against Syrian regime offic officials? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Wafa, sorry. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. Um, so thank you, Vente, and um, thank you for everyone for being here today to talk about this very difficult yet crucial stage of Syria's both present and future. Um, so my name is Wafa Mustafa, and I'm a Syrian journalist and activist. Uh, in 2011, at the beginning of the revolution, I was myself detained in, um, in the branch uh, 215 at the military intelligence directorate in Damascus. And at the same time, my father was arrested uh, by the state security branch in Hama. And a month later, he was released. Uh, but again, in uh, July 2013, uh, my dad was forcibly disappeared by um, the regime in Damascus. So uh, if I'm to say um, my father was a humanitarian who protested against oppression and injustice, and actually today marks um, 2,514 days um, since he was taken from us. And we haven't heard, um, we haven't seen him since then. We haven't uh, heard from him. We don't even know uh, why he was taken or what he was uh, charged with. So uh, I joined Families for Freedom almost year, two years ago. And Families for Freedom is a women-led movement um, um, of, of Syrian women who have uh, their family members uh, missing, uh, detained, or disappeared by Assad, ISIS, or other uh, parties in the country. And all these parties actually till, till today continue to use detention as a weapon to terrorize uh, civilians. And um, so as, as Families for Freedom, we've taken to the streets and we've knocked on every door uh, we can in order to tell uh, our stories to the world. And the day when Al Khatib trial started in Germany last month was a very emotional day uh, for all of us as families, uh, knowing that we are witnessing one step towards justice and accountability uh, in Syria. And uh, although we know uh, that uh, it is a very long journey to go, but it is, uh, and, it, and this is only obviously the start, but it has started. And we, uh, and I wanted to end actually in Syria. So, and actually at the end of uh, this month, I'm, I'm hoping to go to Copeland's uh, to be in the courtroom. And uh, as Syrians, we've been campaigning for years now um, to hold our perpetrators accountable. And actually I want to be uh, in the room to witness uh, this. And if I'm to talk about um, this uh, trial and the messages that I think what it means to us and uh, the messages it's, it sends, I would say that um, obviously it's very important uh, for, the, for the survivors, uh, those who, have, uh, who could actually for the first time uh, speak out before a court uh, about what happened to them and about what is still happening uh, in Syria till the moment. And this trial gives all of us agency over our own lives. And uh, one aspect I would like to talk about is also that this trial actually may plug the attempt of uh, the international community to normalize uh, with Assad. On the other hand, there are um, other Assad officials uh, who think actually that they found refuge in European countries. Uh, and this is a message to all of them that they did not survive and that they will be held accountable and they will be prosecuted for crimes they, they committed. So this is, trial uh, has a huge effect on the future of Syria because it assures that this regime and its officials will not be part of the future of the country. And uh, on, an, on another uh, level, this trial also proves our concerns uh, regarding refugees' deportation to Syria from different countries, European and also neighboring countries. Uh, because we've been saying that Syria is a torture state under Assad regime. So the systematic investigation of uh, the Assad government crimes conducted in Germany actually proves that torture in Assad Syria is systematic and widespread. And it was, it was and it is still actually used as a uh, means to oppress those who oppose the regime and to maintain Assad um, in power. So sending or uh, deporting actually people to Syria means exposing them to detention and torture experiences. And uh, people to be, to be actually, this is a very important point, uh, uh, people are still detained in Syria. So just in 2019, around 5,000 cases of arbitrary arrests 
uh, were documented by uh, Syrian Network for, for Human Rights. So by now, we are all aware of uh, the horrors uh, inside detention centers, starting with the humiliation, the removal of human dignity, and ending, unfortunately, with killing under torture. So uh, maybe uh, this is actually the most important message and the most important aspect in my, uh, in my opinion, that this trial is a great step, uh, a step, but it is one step in a very long, difficult, and definitely exhausting road uh, towards ach achieving justice for Syria and for Syrians. So I believe that this, uh, uh, the important message that this trial sends is that it's not too late to save detainees. Those who are still actually uh, in detention centers till the moment, living under horrific uh, humanitarian condition, conditions, and now uh, in the time of COVID-19, imagine if if it's uh, if it's spread uh, in those underground basements, if not maybe already. So this trial emphasizes now more than ever that the international community must take action as they can still save lives uh, and bring amount, some amount of, of justice to uh, and answers also to families like mine. And it is actually the detainees' right to witness this trial and say what they think about it. And if I am to say honestly what this trial means to me as a, uh, as a daughter of uh, a detainee, I would say I want my dad free. I don't, want to I, I don't want to speak for my dad. I don't want to say what I think he feels uh, about this trial. I want him to have the chance to say what this trial means to him and voice his uh, demands with his own words. Thank you. Thank you, Amina, for this very strong and very personal statement. I think it is clear how difficult it is to talk about these topics and how much courage it actually takes to bring these cases to court and to talk about them in public. Thank you very much. Um, and among the things that you mentioned is that this is one step in the long road, the long and exhausting road you said towards justice. So here I would like to ask Andreas Schiller, who is with the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, the ECCHR. He is the Director of International Crime and Accountability there. Andreas, can you put it into a framework for us? What do you think is the meaning of this? How far do we get with this trial, especially when it comes to the aspect of systematic state accountability? Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. And thank you very much for um, organizing uh, another uh, real talk, which I think is a really great concept to discuss um, those matters here. Um, I think it, basically what has been started already in 2011, uh, not only in Syria with the protests, but also as soon as um, violence by the regime occurred, also by NGOs and prosecutors in Europe um, is now coming to a next um, level. So it's it's the first trial, and as a first trial, it's of course of um, utmost importance because it will set the ground for hopefully many other trials that will follow. And um, but it's also the result already of of the work of of, of many many people um, on different sides on prosecutors, investigators, um, NGOs, survival groups, um, and, and many, many more. Um, that started also in 2011 and 2012, so that's, that is now um, showing its first um, results. So basically what we had is, um, and still having, are a number of investigation collection of um, witness testimonies all over Europe, um, there are a lot of war crimes units in different European countries working together under the um, framework also of the um, EU um, genocide network where they meet and exchange results and investigation um, um, focuses. Um, so it, it's, it's a very strong basis um, which is um, here existing in terms of crimes committed in Syria since 2000. 11, 2012. So there's a lot of evidence already with the authorities and uh, it was only a question of time when the first cases also against um, 
regime uh, perpetrators would um, take off and 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 start to happen. Um, and the trial in in Germany in Koblenz is um, focusing on one specific branch, branch um, 251. So there will be a lot of evidence around that one, but it will certainly also be um, put in the in the context in the framework of um, state torture in Syria um, after 2011, but hopefully even before 2011. Also, the charges focus only um, on on the time uh, 2011 2012. But such a trial is always a chance um, to expose um, in which system these crimes happened. Um, who was responsible? Who was reporting to whom? Who knew what? Um, and um, basically, it's it's going way beyond um, the the cases you you will hear in in the trial and in the courtroom in Copeland. And it will be a first, um, um, I think, very strong case um, and the first time that torture in Syria is is in front of a panel of judges where um, the, the accused can make um, his arguments, where um, all the survivor and witnesses will give their testimony, where the prosecutor already presented the indictment, um, and where after, I think, many days and, and even a months of um, trial sessions, the, the judges will um, will judge about what was happening and what still is happening, basically, also in uh, detention in in Syria. So, um, so of course, the the focus is the individual guilt of the accused. But um, again, in such a trial, um, there will many many will be many many witnesses, expert witnesses, insider witnesses, survivor who will talk. Um, not only about the two individuals um, um, standing trial there, but um, about torture in Syria and the realities um, they survived. Thank you. Um, both Wafa and Anwar, you mentioned it, this trial is of relevance uh, to give also meaning to the quest of many Syrians who are here. It is something that is uh, perceived uh, strongly in the Syrian community. And uh, I have one question from the audience here. Maybe, Andreas, you can just add on this, the media coverage. I, I think that the media coverage is quite important to really help the child to get noticed in the broader audience here in Germany. What would you say? Is the media coverage up to your expectations? Uh, yes, absolutely. There has been a lot of media coverage. Um, uh, globally, as, as far as we can see, not only in Germany. Um, the, so far, um, the first five, six days in court in the last three weeks, there were um, often reports um, afterwards in the main um, German newspapers. And of course, it's important to um, um, kind of um, convey um, what's happening in the courtroom because it's kind of a closed setting. There's no direct um, kind of live streaming out of the courtroom. There's no um, um, recording of of what's happening in the courtroom, but of course, the media, journalists, and also the public has the chance to go there in person to um, to watch and to listen, but more importantly, also to report um, back to the um, outside world. And and um, so there is a lot of media reporting, which is quite satisfying, and um, there's also a number of um, trial monitoring and reporting going on. Um, um, also on our website at ECCHR, there are daily reports in English, German, and Arabic available, um, short summaries of what happened in court. Um, and there are uh, podcasts and other formats um, so that you can follow the trial, um, even if you're not in the courtroom. But of course, I also recommend everyone who has the chance um, to go there at one point in time and um, just to attend one day to see how it works in a German courtroom, how it looks like, uh, because that's a uh, certainly um, another experience in, in reading or listening about it. Great, thank you. Anwar, I would like to come back to you because there were some specific questions addressed to you. One, of course, is very relevant. Do you think that we are going to see more 
members of the Assad regime on trial here. I mean, these are not the most high ranking ones. I know that you've been collecting evidence at different levels. And are you hopeful that we will see more of these cases in front of uh, German courts? And then I would like to add one more question um, coming back to how the um, revelations about Anwar Raslan's identity and his uh, deeds uh, came into knowledge. You know, there is this uh, link um, that he came to Germany with the possible help of Riyad Saif. I would like you to comment on that briefly as well. And Wafa, if you would, I see you nodding. If you would also like to comment on that, maybe you can come after Anwar. Uh. <clears throat> I am not hope, I am sure. Uh, as we will see another, another uh, uh, suspect uh, uh, trial will be opened uh, in, in, in Germany and in uh, other countries in, in, in Europe. Uh, we are looking for that a long time. Uh, we collect evidence, we have uh, testimonies, we follow the uh, perpetrators who Europe as refugees anyway, and we know there is about 1,000 uh, of them uh, arrived already as refugees uh, from, from the other side, uh, all the side in Syria, from uh, uh, PYD, from Free Army sometimes. So uh, we try to find all the uh, criminals who committed crimes against humanity or war crimes uh, uh, and uh, bring them to justice. And I promise uh, it will be uh, as soon as we can. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure about how it will be fast, but it will be uh, maybe not, not so long. So uh, about Anwar, uh, uh, you know, he in 2005, six, he was uh, uh, officer in, in uh, another branch, uh, branch 285 that times. He was major maybe, I, I think. Uh, so I recognize him uh, after that. Uh, so uh, how it's related to Riyad Saif. In fact, uh, Riyad Saif was one of the uh, leader of opposition. And here in Germany, uh, and uh, others recommend uh, uh, Anwar Raslan, Anwar Raslan, to him as uh, officer defector from the regime, and uh, he explained to him that he's suffering in uh, Jordan, and uh, he afraid on his life or like that. So I think uh, that times nobody was thinking about there is accountability or what these people do or what that. Uh, I think it's maybe a mistake to uh, recommend him to the uh, German authority to bring him with visa. But I think it's, uh, I can uh, excuse him because that times uh, maybe nobody thinking. Uh, he must to have from him promise to have his information before and like that, but nobody and he don't give any promising promise to the opposition to give them information or to help for justice or like that. Everybody from the opposition thinking the regime will fall and we will back to Syria and maybe the accountability and justice will open in Syria sometimes. So maybe nobody care enough about this point. So uh, I, I cannot blame now anybody about uh, bring him. Uh, they must to be more care at times, uh, but they didn't. That's a problem. Uh, but uh, in fact, about others, uh, there is others. And uh, uh, as I told you, uh, there is about 1,000. Uh, we try to follow, and uh, for sure, we cannot do anything without uh, our partner ECCHR because they are, they do the great job, in fact, not us. We just help, uh, but uh, uh, 
job, uh, the great mission. I don't uh, tell it as job. They are uh, don't feel it as job. It's mission to them, and I feel that with their uh, uh, deal with the with the issue about Syria. All of them, Andreas, Patrick, Wolfgang, uh, uh, Lily, uh, and. Uh, Yaro and the others beside Ibrahim and Jumana and all the team working in the uh, uh, Syrian issue, uh, all of them, it's uh, a mission to them. And we cannot do anything without, uh, without them, uh, in fact. But uh, uh, the criminals will not escape, will not ever have any uh, uh, chance to hide. Uh, in Europe, uh, it, in fact, it's not for Syria. It's for all the world. It's for uh, uh, Europe and for other countries who maybe uh, faces same situation of Syria. And there is many group from criminal in Saudi Arabia, in Turkish, in in uh, Algeria. Every maybe think to do like Bashar, and that they still immunity and still feel comfortable about nobody will touch them. Uh, uh, that mean maybe millions, tens of millions of refugees will arrive to Europe, run away or escape from the likely this kill. What happened and what happened in Germany and in other countries in Europe, it's it's not just message to to Syrian killers. Thank you very For much, Anwar. So I think we have also a comment here that kind of adds to this. Uh, you said it's a global thing; it's for all. Uh, here also, I read a comment saying it's not just for this generation, but also for the next. But one thing that you just mentioned, Wafa. Anyway, I wanted to come to you, and the question here is: first of all, um, how is it for those who are still seeking for justice, but they are maybe not here, or maybe it is difficult for them to follow in German language? How accessible? is information to them through which channels would they do so and how much are the families of detainees included in the process mm -hmm. well um, uh, yeah if, oh, sorry yeah I'm no worries uh, well this is a good question since I since I don't really speak German so uh, this is something I, I actually um, I actually worry about or I was worried about uh, before the trial started uh, last month but as I guess, as uh, Andrea said, uh, the, um, the ECCHR uh, page on Facebook and their website and uh, um, like the, the news updates, uh, they do um, each, uh, each uh, hearing or each uh, session is very useful because it is not only in English uh, besides German, obviously, but also in Arabic, which is very important because um, I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, if we are, who is this uh, trial important for? Us as refugees outside Syria? Then this is, this is a, a huge question. What about Syrians inside Syria who actually under very, very uh, difficult circumstances, maybe they don't, maybe they might not have access actually to the media or maybe uh, it's banned. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely pretty dangerous to follow the news of this trial. But at least the fact they actually have the choice that um, uh, uh, the media is talking about this um, uh, material uh, is written in Arabic about this trial is very, is very, very important, specifically when it comes from a very uh, trusted uh, source such as EC, uh, ECCHR. And also, I mean, obviously we, we for example, at Families for Freedom, uh, uh, we, we are following this um, on daily basis. Uh, but we are also trying, we are concerned of uh, distributing this uh, information and reaching out to other families who might not actually have access to the internet or maybe, uh, I don't know, to, to websites or might maybe not know about the, um, the ECCHR or other organizations. So this is a huge, a huge circle of distributing knowledge that we should all, I guess, 
we all have a role in this and 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 everyone uh we we might think that it's not what it, it maybe it's not very important to write about this the media is talking about this but actually it is on on social media um we reach out to uh, to an audience that uh, the media might not reach out to so we are trying our best i would say uh, and we are and this is uh, this is the crucial point that we are actually concerned that uh families and syrians maybe not uh, have access to uh, to this information, so uh, we are trying also to work on this. And if you allow me one more question regarding those who are involved in bringing justice, I know that the Syrian regime has a long record in threatening and harassing people from the opposition, witnesses, etc., also outside of Syria. Are you aware of any pressure that people are facing or is it maybe also a problem that many still have family members inside and they are fed for them? Definitely. I mean, uh, um, both, uh, both aspects are right. People, Syrians outside Syria are, are still actually um, either pressured directly by the regime or uh, like uh, those who are loyal or pro the regime, but also people are actually under the pressure of fear. Even if you are not threatened directly by someone when you are in Germany, in Jordan, or in other anywhere, you are under the pressure of fear because everyone, almost everyone, we all have families in Syria, inside Syria. So if we are not if I'm not to worry maybe about the, the fate of my father, who is actually detained uh, by Assad, I'm, I'm definitely to worry about uh, the lives of my family who is still there. Uh, and, uh, and so this year, is, this, this year is complicated. And uh, even in Germany, for example, you are, we are thinking all the time about this. We consider this um, every time, for example, I write something on Twitter, on Facebook, I, I think of this. this fear is it has never actually disappeared but it is a matter I, I guess of like um like a personal um choice to 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 decide how to what extent um to be like exposed on social media uh, or maybe just to keep your uh, activism or um like your uh, i don't know your work maybe uh, offline so i guess i would say that from my, from my, actually, from my surroundings, for example, in Germany, um, I know a lot of people who actually work under maybe different names because they are, they still have families in Syria, but they do huge work and they are actually, um, like they played a huge role in uh, this process of, uh, uh, that led actually us to this day and uh, give us the chance to talk about this trial in Germany. Thank you. Andreas, I have uh, two questions for you. One is regarding to the witnesses that Anwar Aslan said that could speak out in his favor. He mentioned that there are 23 witnesses that can testify uh, about his behavior because he obviously claims he tried to do the best he says he didn't have the responsibility. So how do you rate the chances of these 23 witnesses uh, to come to Germany? I understand that some might already be here, but if they have to come from outside, how do you see the chances that they can be brought here? That is one of the questions. And the second one, actually, it is not only to you, but I'd like to start with you. Is it not actually the wrong person to try in light of all the major offenses that others have committed of all the bigger crimes, so to say? Isn't he kind of a small fish? This is a question that we see from here. And in addition, maybe also we could ask, will this be a rather symbolic trial that we might need to be afraid of when we see uh, the tendency to normalize? Is this maybe a symbolic case only and we will not uh, really make progress on this issue of justice? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, to the first question, um, of course, the the accused have, have the right to call in witnesses, and then the court will decide whether and and and, and how many they they, they will hear. Um, and um, certainly, there will be um, uh, witnesses giving testimony in court, um, also called in by the defense. And I think that's the 
important part also of such a trial that um, the accused can defend themselves, um, um, but also the, the civil parties, the survivors, and, and the prosecutor, and also the court can call in, in uh, witnesses. And in the end, we will have um, a, a, a judgment um, and basically um, judging on all the testimonies brought into the court. So um, I expect certainly that there will be um, a number of defense witnesses um, if all, all he called or, or um, not exactly all of them, we will see um, those um, not living in Germany would need to turn up um, on a voluntary basis. Um, on the second question, um, I think it's a quite important case here and um, the charges include um, at a minimum 4,000 cases of torture and 58 killings um, against um, the main accused. Um, and uh, I mean, that's not a small fish, that's, that's, that's huge. I mean, if, if you compare to um, other murder cases in Germany, we're talking about one murder and these are big cases. Here it's a, at least 58 persons killed and more than 4,000 tortured. And if you listen to the indictment of the prosecutor and uh, a number of um, testimonies um, read out by witnesses as part of the indictment, um, each of, of, of the stories is, uh, is quite horrific. So, and, and that um, at least 4,000 times. So that's already quite big. Um, but of course, it's also um, one trial and it's important um, also that, of course, it's not the last one. Um, I mean, we, we really welcome that there are arrest warrants um, out there. For example, against um, Jamil Hassan, the former Air Force Intelligence Chief. Um, he's also wanted by an international arrest warrant um, by Germany. So it would depend whether he will be at one point um, extradited and stand also trial in Germany. Um, and so that would go to the highest level of responsibility. Um, and also in France, for example, there are three um, arrest warrants uh, out uh, against high level um, uh, suspects from the Syrian regime. So basically, um, you need to see this trial also in the context that it's, um, um, it's about quite a significant number of, of um, um, tortured um, people and, and killed. Um, it's about a short time frame, basically. The, the charges are about 2011, 2012 only. So, I mean, imagine the dimension of, of torture and victims um, if, you, um, if you look into a bigger um, time frames and, um, and in the whole context of, of Syria. So, um, so that's, I think, the context in which uh, this trial is um, currently taking place. Just to mention that uh, currently we have more than 260 people who are following this talk, which is really showing once again how much interest the subject raises. I'm very happy that we have all of these attendees here. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I have an additional question that is more to the technical side, but it has political implications as well. Uh, one of the uh, other questions is uh, Germany has a specific part about its uh, use of the universal jurisdiction, which is that there does not need to be a direct nexus, so either perpetrator or um, affected person is from Germany. So this is quite, quite different from most other European states, but if I get the question correctly, um, the person on trial needs to be in Germany. And the question is, do you think that this fosters uh, the, um, the impunity? Because most perpetrators, especially the high ranking ones, are unlikely to ever be caught and uh, unlikely to ever be present in German courts? I guess it goes to me again. Um, so, of course, the German juris universal jurisdiction laws um, allows for for such trials, and the person need to be in Germany. Um, it's different in France, for example, where also in absentia trials are possible. So each European um, jurisdiction there has, has quite some similarities. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, there's the possibilities through arrest warrants and extradition procedures uh, to get also suspects uh, into Germany, uh, like now in a um, Yazidi related case, it just happens that someone was extradited from Greece and is now standing trial in Frankfurt. 
um, so that that is also used so that also even if people are not in Germany, um, there are means to bring them to Germany to stand trial. And I also wouldn't um, exclude that uh, some of the main responsibles at one point in time will, will stand trial. Um, just just this week there was um, an arrest in France, uh, still in relation to the genocide in Rwanda against one of the main suspects. Um, it's now 25, more than 25 years after it happened, and, and he will now stand trial. So um, uh, the, the, the arm of justice or international justice is quite long. Uh, the charges, the crimes will not um, um, prescribe, so there's no, they, they will not uh, run out after 10 or 20 years. They will always be prosecutable. There's a lot of evidence out there. Um, so we hope trials will happen soon, but even in the long term, um, um, I think we can um, expect uh, a number of trials, even if it takes uh, some time. So the arm of justice is long, but we also need quite a long breath. Um, Anwar, I would like to ask you, how did you actually identify witnesses? How did you manage to bring these witnesses together? And how many witnesses participated in this case from ACCHR on your side? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we, 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 we maybe when start up to 2016 with ACCHR, we start with the uh, security, uh, military security branches. Uh, so that times I had to uh, call the people uh, with my Facebook uh, to to uh, contact us uh, uh, if they was uh, uh, detainees in that branch. But for the case of Copeland's, most of the people who uh, be uh, involved with us and join with the uh, case, I know them personally because I defended uh, them uh, when they were in Syria. So uh, when when uh, we co start cooperate with the prosecution prosecutor, uh, uh, we, uh, maybe the first uh, uh, I contact about twelve victims who were uh, in this branch uh, uh, arrested in that times, and uh, all of them uh, enjoyed. And after that, many part uh, many organizations, Syrian organization. Uh, uh, help to to find others uh, victims, and now we have uh, I think uh, 24, uh, uh, 23 or 24 victims and witnesses uh, in this case. 17 of them uh, uh, defended by uh, ECC, and uh, uh, they they, they uh, came uh, by by ECCHR by us and by other Syrian organization who uh, cooperate with this. Just I, I, I uh, missed to uh, focus about or answer about the question about why we choose uh, Anwar R, Anwar Raslan case, uh, because uh, maybe, uh, in fact, and that is so clear, not we are who choose to start prosecute Anwar Raslan. Because until, uh, uh, until the uh, investigation starts, I personally don't know where he was in the revolution times. And I know him, he was in the uh, security, uh, state security in the branch 285, but I don't know really if there is any chance to follow him in, in, in Germany. And when we start uh, to find the uh, uh, capacity to follow the criminals here, we start in, about the criminals in Syria, but who start the uh, investigation against uh, Anwar are, in fact, many refugees arrived in the wave of refugees to Germany, and while they, they gave their testimony in front of the immigration uh, investigator, they mention Anwar Raslan as person who responsible about them. From that, the, the police start investigation about Anwar Raslan. And they start with their investigation and collect information from the foreign minister and from the Auslander, Behordar, and uh, 
comes from 2017. But at 2018, the files arrived to the prosecutor after they finish all their uh, investigation. That times we start to cooperate with the prosecutor uh, with the case of Anwar Raslan. So it's so clear we didn't start the investigation and uh, we didn't uh, uh, tell the uh, police or the uh, prosecutor about them. In fact, himself, when he went to the police and asked protection because he feel, as he pretend, he feel uh, insecurity and he feel we, he was threatened by the uh, regime, he told the police Syria and what he do in Syria. So from that, the police compare the information from him and from the refugees when they arrived at 2015 and start the investigation against him. Could you briefly, <clears throat> Anwar, uh, could you briefly also comment on the statement that Anwar Raslan released? We touched upon it, but can yeah. you uh, please comment a bit further on it? Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, I, I think as lawyer, not as uh, as lawyer, uh, it's a stupid step because he defend about himself with very wrong side. He put himself with the regime in the same package. He don't defend about himself as I don't com committed the crimes and other committed the crimes and there is torture to torture the people and kill the people and that everybody knows it. Uh, and nobody can deny this uh, uh, fact. In, uh, so uh, uh, he put himself with the regime and he deny not about himself, he don't torture the people while the other uh, uh, officer tortures him. He denied there is any torture in the branch and in the uh, security. And that very stupid defense, uh, defense in fact, because uh, uh, these this facts, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's proved very easy. So when, when these people die in this branch, when the uh, uh, victims will give their testimony about the torture in this branch, that will be uh, destroyed all this. If he maybe uh, focus about himself, maybe he can uh, be more clever about that. I don't know if uh, it's his idea or uh, the lawyer idea, but in fact, it's proof that this guy, maybe he changed the place of his mission when he left Syria, but he didn't change his mission anyway. He didn't change his job. He's still in the same job, but he changed the place, just the place, because he uh, adopted the, the uh, idea of Bashar al-Assad when he spoke about in front of the media in, in, and recently in, in, in uh, November 2019 with uh, uh, interview with uh, Russia today, he mentioned, hey, okay, there is no systematic torture in Syria, but there is somebody maybe torture uh, the people, visual mistake. And uh, uh, Anwar Raslan adopted this and he defends with his statement about all the regime. He denied there is systematic torture. He systematic uh, uh, killed the people and uh, taught, uh, arrested the people. And that's a mistake in my opinion. Well, that's a very good point. The denial of the regime <laughs> that we see reflected in this statement. Uh, the regime has always denied any kind of involvement and always blamed it on individuals. Uh, Wafa, could I ask you this uh, strategy of the regime to completely deny and insist on denial for all the time? Uh, for me, it is about a battle of narratives and by pure repetition and by um, some people's interest to turn the page with Syria, I have the impression it is becoming more powerful, 
the regime narrative, the Russian promoted narrative. Do you think that these trials actually will also help in this war of narratives that they will empower Syrians to use their agency and also speak out on what actually happened to them and not allow the, the, the promoted um, propaganda of the regime to win in this battle of how the Syrian history is being told? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is, this is a very important aspect um, for the past, um, I would say two, maybe uh, three years, we've been noticing that also from our position as activists who left Syria and now in another, um, uh, in another places, and uh, we noticed that, that, the, that the regime actually throughout uh, the past nine years have been not only uh, trying so hard uh, using all means to win over the military war, but also more importantly, actually, um, they were concerned to win over the narrative war. And this is pretty obvious. I mean, obviously, um, uh, through the media, the regime, uh, uh, official media, and uh, now with the help of, uh, of Russia and uh, Russian trolls, and uh, the way they, they systematically um, uh, do campaigns, against um, specific topics such as uh, the civil defense, for example, in Syria, or um, uh, maybe recently also uh, Abdel Basit Saroud, who died, uh, uh, who got killed actually last, last year. So uh, uh, knowing, noticing that this, uh, this is very important for the regime, uh, also we felt that uh, uh, with the limitation of uh, what actually Syrians think that they can do now, because hope is being actually um, more difficult uh, day after day. And uh, uh, we've been, for years, Syrians been wondering that, okay, so we've been doing this and this and this, but is there actually a result? Like, uh, and, and this is hard, this is not, not, not very easy. And, and, uh, and holding on to hope uh, when you are a Syrian is very, very difficult. And, uh, and I guess when we decide that, when we are aware of the importance uh, the importance of the the narrative war. I think we can we can do more and we can do better. And uh, 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 the trial is actually very very crucial on this level because, for example, in Germany we've been uh, um, I've been like a, a part of of uh, an orga organization called uh, Adopt Revolution, and we've been trying to um, steer up like uh, the German debate uh, regarding Syria, different aspects, refugees, reconstruction, normalization, detainees, and we've been telling stories for years now. But actually, when it comes uh, 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 strategically, when it comes from a legal authority, it it emphasizes and and uh, uh, strengthens actually what we've been trying our efforts during the past few years. So this is not actually, it doesn't validate what we were saying because it's definitely valid, but it adds another uh, maybe trusted layer to the, to the public uh, that we've been trying to reach out to. And uh, we are aware of this, and I guess this is why it's very important uh, 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 if we are able to, and if we want to, it's very important to talk to the media, uh, to talk about the trial, to discuss it with, uh, with everywhere on social media, with friends, uh, outside. This is the moment where, uh, where you can just uh, get people's attention uh, with maybe less effort. And do you think that it will also have an impact on what you mentioned in your initial statement, the constant fear that states might be starting to send refugees back to Syria because of not seeing the human rights violations that are continuing? And also on the policy, I have a question here, um, and not only for sending people back to the country, but for future admission of asylum seekers. One person is wondering whether you think that this trial will affect transparency in the procedures that are often very long, long and uh, very inefficient and that it will lead to more transparent um, procedures as well as admitting more of those who are really in need of seeking asylum and not so many perpetrators? Um, okay, so, um, so the first question was, I'm sorry, I got lost. Um, what was your first question? 
sorry, I was wondering whether the trial might positively affect that states are not sending refugees yeah. back. And the second one is related to it, whether they will uh, create more transparent procedures and have a more just asylum policy towards those who need it. Mm. Well, regarding normalization with Assad, I believe that, uh, uh, that it will definitely, it has a huge effect on this level. And uh, we know that next month, actually, uh, the, uh, the interior ministers in Germany are meeting uh, um, and on their agenda, they will discuss uh, whether Syria, th this topic, whether Syria is safe or not. And we've been trying also as activists in Germany, we've been trying to, um, uh, to go uh, to, the, to each city where these ministers actually uh, uh, hold their meeting. And we've been trying to be part of, uh, of uh, like uh, demonstrations or whatever kind of uh, uh, acts or uh, expressions uh, that were taking place there. And we think that now uh, we've been also, this is like uh, uh, our main concern and our main point while campaigning against uh, the discussion that Syria is safe and against deporting refugees is that uh, what, when sending refugees back to Syria, you are exposing them to a definite uh, uh, torture and detention uh, experience. And now, definitely more than ever, it is said not only by us, again, as activists, as Syrians, maybe as opposition in this, this is our position in this narrative war, now it is said by the German court, by legal authorities. So it's, again, it definitely emphasizes our, uh, uh, our own uh, uh, arguments. Um, well, regarding the other question, I would, I would rather leave it maybe to Andreas. Uh, I don't think that this is my uh, place to, to answer. Okay, but I have still another question that you might really be able to answer for us. Uh, do you have any idea how big the outreach of the trial is in Syrian family homes in Germany if people are not activists? Is it also reaching people who are not in the activist or journalist scene? Do you know anything about the discussions they are having about it? Uh, well, um, I think uh, this is this is an important point when I talked also about the uh, the media or my, maybe they reach out uh, to Syrians. Um, well, the the one thing is that uh, the language that is used when talking about the the trial is might be not familiar, obviously, to all of us uh, who don't come from uh, legal backgrounds. So I think this is one aspect that we. We, uh, in collaboration with obviously um, uh, uh, entities or organizations who are working directly on 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 uh, releasing this information, to to localize the the, the language that is used uh, when talking about the trial and the news, because also it makes it a bit harder for uh, for for those who are non not familiar uh, with these maybe with I don't know with legal um, aspects of of. Uh, uh, of the, the Syrian case now uh, makes it harder for them to keep up and to follow and to understand. And uh, also, uh, this, is, this is why I think, for, for example, one thing I, I and also in Families for Freedom we are concerned about is um, educating ourselves regarding this, uh, because this is not a legal issue anymore. This is not like a, like a mere legal issue where we don't have any role and we are the audience. We are uh, part of this process. And this is why it is very important to, col to collaborate between, uh, 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 between, uh, between us or maybe all the families of, of, uh, of victims and survivors and everyone who actually have interest uh, with organizations and uh, entities such as ACCHR to not only uh, 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 distribute and release uh, knowledge uh, about uh, the, the, what is happening now in the trial, but also to educate people and make it easier for them to understand what is universal jurisdiction, for example. Uh, even in Arabic, the name, the, the, the term is not, is not very understandable, it's not easy, it's not something we are familiar with. So this is, I guess, very important, um, making the knowledge uh, regarding all aspects of this trial, not only the news now, but also all like the 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 steps, the the process of what happened, what were uh, the legal maybe ways uh, that led us to this to, to this day, 
uh, make it accessible for uh, for Syrians uh, in everyone who is uh, maybe interested uh, to know about this. Thank you. I get a lot of questions here as you, because the longer you talk, the more we actually all see how much we sh still should learn and would like to learn about what is going on here and what is the background of it. So I apologize to all in the audience that we are unfortunately unable to absorb more questions. I still have a very long list and we will need to rush a bit to be able to address the ones that are here as priorities, but we'll try our best. And therefore, I would like to ask one question that I'm getting here in terms of the types of crimes, which, uh, what is the role of uh, sexualized violence um, on trial here? Is it playing a role in this case? How is ECCHR uh, addressing it? Uh, Andreas, I think if you could answer to this one. Yes, sure. Um, sexual violence is part of the charges. Um, for example, cases of rape, but uh, the way the prosecutor put it in the indictment um, seems not um, satisfactory so that it will only play a minor role. Um, I think it's now up to us and the civil parties to um, put it in, in, in the right context to, um, to make it not. Um, be, be um, pushed aside basically um, by, by some of the other charges. Um, so that's certainly something that will come up uh, during the trial, which um, I think we haven't mentioned it here, which, which could easily last uh, uh, one and a half, two years or longer. And certainly at one stage, um, there will also be um, a, a focus on, on, on sexual violence. Um, um, because it's good that it has been um, um, charged, but again, we have a number of questions and comments and the way it was kind of formally or technically legally um, introduced by the prosecutors and uh, especially also the question uh, whether it's um, seen as part of this um, widespread and systematic attack on the civilian population, which basically is the definition for crimes against humanity or whether the prosecutor rather see it as uh, individual cases, um, which would be um, um, against uh, what we've um, um, learned and, and, and read in a number of reports um, on this topic, of course, coming um, from Syria. And coming to the question of who can be tried for what, there is one question saying that in Syria there is immunity for officers from perse persecution for acts done during service. The question is, does this immunity also extend to Germany? The second question is regarding the nationality, particularly here the question is uh, Bashar's wife also holds British nationality. Could she uh, just travel to Britain, could she have immunity there? Um, when it comes to international crimes, there's uh, no such immunity to act in um, uh, official function. So that's why this trial here is possible. Um, when it's about crimes against humanity and, and, and war crimes, for example, um, the only immunity which currently um, prevents, for example, Germany or France or other states from issuing more arrest warrants is the head of state immunity of um, Bashar al-Assad. Um, as long as he's um, head of state, um, there's a recognized Im immunity uh, under international law. So um, he's kind of being blocked, but all others basically, even in, if, if they claim to act in a official function, um, don't have immunity if, if they commit international crimes in this function. Then there is also a question, now we're all talking about the Syrian case because we have this one already. However, there are other states for which this principle of a universal jurisdiction might also be interesting if we look into Libya or Yemen. Is, the, I mean, is it uh, very particular that Syrians get the chance to make use of this principle here? Or do you think that also for Yemenites or Libyans or others, it would be possible to address their, uh, their um, crimes against humanity here in Germany? 
our hope is that there will be also other cases, other trials, and also on other conflicts in Germany, also in other countries based on universal jurisdiction. Um, I mean, it's a specific constellation here with so many um, survivors in Germany, in Europe, with um, so much uh, great documentation done by Syrian organizations and international ones, um, with also some of the um, perpetrators in. Europe or out with Syria. So there are certain um, conditions here which um, permitted to have this first trial here. Um, but I just mentioned the case on Rwanda. Um, I, there are other cases going on in different countries uh, with um, international crimes committed in, in, in Liberia or in former Yugoslavia or other countries. So um, we hope that all the expertise, the um, authorities, the prosecutor's office, the, the courts will gain through such a trial, um, will also um, allow for other trials in the future. Um, and at, at ECCHR, we filed already a number of cases concerning, for example, um, Sri Lanka, concerning also the um, Yemeni context um, on uh, European arms exports, um, also with regard to um, uh, including U.S. torture. There were uh, cases brought by us uh, in various jurisdictions, um, such as Germany and France. So basically, the, the principle is there. Cases can be brought forward, but um, it, it depends on a number of factors, of course, whether in the end they succeed to trial or whether they succeed to arrest warrants or to other um, summons or measures by authorities or, um, or whether they are kind of um, closed or put on hold. So um, we hope that universal jurisdiction becomes uh, more normal and that the prosecutor and, and also states are, are willing to take more cases and also from um, other um, conflict regions or, or um, potential crime situations. Given that, unfortunately, we are approaching the last statements, I have one for you, Andreas, that is, we need to see how long this might all take. I mean, the um, statement of Anwar Raslan, one commentator says, might prolong the trial, so possibly we'll face years and years of this going on. Do you have any assessment how long it might take to see a, a verdict in this case? Um, no, it's it's quite difficult to say because um, in such a trial every day in court some things can happen that prolong or shorten uh, such a trial. So um, there was a war crimes trial on um, with regard to the Republic of Congo um, some years ago in Germany that lasted on four years. Um, there are other trials that only last um, six or nine months where it comes to international crimes. So I guess we were we are somewhere between these um, yeah nine months or a year year and a half um, up to three four years um, but it's difficult to um, to predict because every day in court of course can change something the fact that um, Anwar R didn't um, confess uh, allegations against him of course um, um, means it's, it needs more proof um, what's in the indictment charge. So it's, um, it certainly looks like it will um, prolong the trial. Um, I think so that's something we can say after yesterday. Thank you. Um, Anwar and Wafa, I would like to ask you to do a last comment on the expectations of Syrians regarding uh, justice. I mean, does this trial actually enhance people's expectation of justice being done? And particularly looking to Syria, those who are inside, is this trial also likely to send a signal to perpetrators? Do you think that it might have a positive impact on uh, limiting the human rights violations being committed inside Syria? Wafa, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, well, this is also one thing I wanted to say earlier. Um, and this is why, actually, uh, this is a main reason why I wanted to go to Copeland's and sit in the courtroom. For me, this is now I'm learning and being introduced to the concept of justice. We've been demanding justice for years, and we all in theory, know what is justice, know what we want when we say that we demand justice. 
But now we are being introduced to justice face to face. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know um, so far, I'm not sure what it looks like. I know that, uh, that this is just first step towards justice. And I think what I keep t telling myself is that the road is very long. And I keep telling myself this like on daily basis, because definitely like the trial gives gave us hope it gave me hope i even for a second i hope that um that's it they will release all detainees what else do we need and then um that was what we've been waiting for for a second i i definitely thought so but but well it, it needs practice but then i also uh, told myself that well this is Again, this is a long, exhausting road. Um, it's good, definitely. It's needed to have uh, hope, but it's also needed uh, to have uh, patience. Uh, and if we are actually to 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 keep this hope, we need actually. I I, I believe we need to engage more in the process because this what makes us as Syrians um, feel that uh, uh, these are not only the results of uh, something uh, distant, something we don't know really about. This is the result of something legal I don't really understand. No, this is the result of uh, a collaboration among between um, thousands of Syrians, uh, uh, those who, who worked on documentation, uh, survivors in the first place, definitely, who uh, were also um, who were supported by their families and their surroundings to actually step forward and speak up and say, I want to, uh, uh, to prosecute uh, this person and this regime. So it takes a lot of effort. And I think uh, that uh, justice will, I might, and this is something I, I always say that I myself might not uh, see the day that justice will be achieved in Syria, but my hope is that um, next gener generation or maybe next generation uh, will see it. And, and for me, and this is very uh, uh, personal, and this is what actually my dad told me at the beginning of the revolution. He said that, that the exact same sentence, that I'm happy not because I didn't even uh, think that I will witness this, and I'm honored that I actually witnessed this moment, but I am also aware that um, I might not witness the victory or maybe the, the freedom of this country, but uh, it's good enough for me. It's satisfying enough that I know that someone will. And now it goes um, the same for me. Thank you. Anwar, what would you like to add to this? Your microphone? Anwar, your microphone is still off. Anwar, you need to turn on your microphone. It's not uh, yet. Now, uh, we hear that, you. Uh, in fact, that what uh, Wafa spoke about it. It's the main uh, uh, issue we work on it to ha give hope message to the victim, not the victim of this uh, branch or this uh, uh, suspect only. It's give hope that justice it start and to give uh, 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 like this you, you don't you don't imagine how much people uh, uh, encourage to involve to to come after we start and after this trail how people uh, victims in fact be brave uh, uh, and encouraged to to come and join with uh, with with uh, uh, our our work uh, uh, with accountability the other thing, in fact, it's a message to the criminals who uh, feel comfortable in Syria uh, that they have immunity, full immunity in the Syrian law, and they uh, comfortable about standing of Russia and uh, China. Council, they will give a veto for any uh, chance to transfer the Syrian file to uh, ICC, International Criminal Court. So it's mes message to all of them. This comfortable about impunity, it's over now. 
the immunity and impunity time, it's over for all of you. So you don't imagine how much the uh, news coming from Syria inside now, how much criminals try to uh, have a new passport with new names, how much of them start to change their, their uh, 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 faces. To, uh, they, they now feel terror, really. Uh, the news coming from Syria like that. They uh, now, now terrified what happened uh, 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 against them. They feel uh, themselves in trap now in Syria. They cannot move. So it's so, so important to us. And it's so important this trial, in fact, in, in what we did. It's the first time in the history the justice controlled by victim, just victims not by state, like others' uh, uh, justice it happened in Rwanda, in uh, Yugoslavia, in, uh, until Nuremberg, until others in, in Iraq. All of it managed by state, by international will. This is the first time in the history, victim, just victim who control and manage the transitional justice, justice of, of their countries. And it didn't happen. Never start any uh, uh, justice like this in history by victim. The victim come after there is will to start uh, court or start uh, 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 kind of uh, in ICC or in a special a special uh, court like uh, Rwanda or Kosovo. For that. It's so important for, not just for, for, for us, it's so important for all the world, as I, I mentioned before. So uh, it will be Mark, Mark Land in the history, in fact. <laughs> Thank you. These are very strong statements, uh, like a message against immunity and a message of hope. I really hope that this is the beginning of something major that will change the life of people who really hope uh, for justice and accountability. And I would like to thank you all for contributing to this interesting debate. Thank you, Anwar, Wafa and Andreas. Thank you also to Rebecca and Amina behind the scenes uh, for organizing all this and making it happen, as well, of course, as Marion the Bard College, ECCHR, Volksbühne, the Syria Campaign, and Families for Freedom. It was a very, very interesting debate, and I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And, uh, and for everybody really uh, involved with this, uh, make this uh, meeting, it's uh, happened. Thank you.